Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm the founder of the Think Tank for Women in Business and Technology and the FemPIC platform with the mission of raising women's socioeconomic status. One of the important verticals that we will be working on at the Think Tank for Women in Business and Technology is the impact of unique biological changes that we experience as women. Things like PMS, childbirth, and menopause. In this episode, I speak with Marion Stewart, a leading figure in all things related to women's health and especially around the experience of menopause. Marion is the author of many books and articles, including a regular column at the Daily Mail. And throughout her legendary career, she has helped tens of thousands of women regain control of their biology, especially as they approach midlife through what she calls a midlife review. Marion and her team have now developed a program for corporations to help them support their female employees through this crucial phase of their lives. So here's my conversation with Marion Stewart. So one of the first things I wanted to talk to you about, Marion, was that I felt that our Femtech conference was the least attended of the three. Of course, it could have been partly because it was very close to um, you know, the, the new year and Christmas. But w- from talking to a lot of the people who have expressed interest and have joined our list, what they told me, it seems like the concept of femtech was very unfamiliar to them. And I had actually noticed that when we first started working on it. And uh, that's why I changed it, the word femtech to uh, women's health technology. Um, it's kind of a, a sad, uh, I guess, but true fact. It's a bit of a shame that it seems like people can't necessarily or don't necessarily associate women's health with technology. So when you put the two words together, it seems like it's more alien and less familiar to them, which is kind of ironic because I feel that technology is the key to solving so many things uh, that we don't know about female biology. You know, so many data gap, so much data gap that we have, you know, that all of that needs to be addressed. And there's no other way of doing that without technology, right? So I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. What do you think about the impact of technology on women's health and how we think about it? Well, if I take it the other way around, I think let's talk about how we think about it, first of all, because there's a massive education gap. And what's not widely understood, which is, I think, where the problem lies, is that there is a solution for, and we're talking about menopause today, perimenopause and menopause, which so this big M word that people don't really want to go there for so many reasons, because it makes them feel old and past it. It makes them feel out of control because when they get the symptoms, they haven't got a clue how to deal with them and probably nor of their doctors for the most part. And so when you're talking about femme, the femme bit and health, They don't understand that there's a solution. And I know that for sure because there was a government report published that was a review of 104 medical papers over 26 years. And it was published in 2017, all on menopause. And it was mostly about the problem and not the solution. And even now, I think the UK is ahead of the US in that there are more companies opening their doors to the possibility of help for menopause in the workplace. But a lot of what's going on is either medical menopause or it is helping to raise awareness about women needing help at menopause. So, for example, there's a campaign to get desk firms and better ventilation and more flexible working hours. And whilst I hear that and think, well, that sounds good in theory, actually, women don't just want an M badge when they get to menopause. They want a solution. But the problem is they don't even realize there is a solution. And we did a survey of a thousand women about a year ago, it's the year before last now, and we found that 96% of them said that they weren't prepared for menopause and two thirds of them said they felt robbed of life as they knew it. And that's the problem. They have absolutely no idea that they can feel better. They don't know what's going on in their body. No one's explaining it to them. They don't know that if they have a midlife refuel, they can feel better than they can remember. And so when you say femtech, they really have no idea how that could possibly work. And tech is probably new 
to them anyway, especially if they're in their 50s. They're not like people in their 20s and 30s who are much more switched on to tech. And so there's probably a, a lot of misunderstanding about what that actually means. And so I think we have to wind it back. And we're not just trying to educate them about femtech, because of course, that's the way we're going to reach millions of women simultaneously. We can't do it any other way. But there's got to be a solution that you can turn into tech. And that's what we're working on at the moment, because I've been helping women for the last 28 years. I've helped probably more than 100,000 women feel better, symptom free. And everything we do is based on published medical research and it's all natural. But it's not widely known about. And so we're starting from a really far back position. There's this massive education piece that needs to happen. And I think also in the workplace, particularly, companies don't understand what's going on under the radar. So in 2019, Forbes said that menopause is costing $810 billion globally each year because of lost productivity. So if the companies come to understand that, and at the moment we're going into companies, we partner with Virgin Care and various other companies, we're going in doing surveys, anonymous surveys, to show what the suffering is, what the symptom scores are, and how much productivity women feel they're losing. Because in our survey of 1,000 women in the workplace, we found that 84% of them said that their productivity was really way down for more than eight days a month. And we know that that's costing a lot of money. So... This year, one of the things we're focusing on is the economic model and showing that when you get women back into really good shape, when they have their midlife refuel, they actually get turbocharged. They get their brain back. They can think straight. They can sleep well. Their thermometer's in check. You know, they're not getting these terrible hot surges. And they feel better than they can remember. And therefore, they're much more likely to stay in the workplace and be productive. Because we know at the moment that one in four women are leaving the workplace because of menopause. And in fact, there was a, a doctor's survey published at, in the UK a few months ago, showing that 90% of doctors of menopausal age were having trouble with their symptoms. And I think it was 45% of them were thinking of cutting down to part-time or leaving the workplace. And I just cried when I heard that because it's, it's atrocious. Everything we do is based on published medical research. It's all in the literature, but the doctors are not educated. And so even they aren't in a position to help themselves, let alone their patients. And so I think there's a, a massive opportunity for corporates to take the bat on and to incorporate a solution in the workplace. Some companies have well-being wallets, so people can pay for it themselves. Other companies are choosing to pay for it and invest a little money, and they will get back probably tenfold what they invest, because the women will become much more productive. And so I think we've got a lot of work to do and a lot of education for, for on all fronts for the women and also the corporations. And obviously, at some point, for the doctors as well. You paint a very hopeful picture. But what's interesting to me is that you mentioned in the conference, and um, you also mentioned now, that women, a lot of women in their 40s and 50s are, uh, although this is in a way, this is actually the fastest growing sector of the uh, workplace, um, but at the same time, there a lot of them are feeling like they want to leave because they feel that they're not being as productive. On the one hand, I, I'm hearing something like that from you, and that was my understanding from my research. But when I started this movement, um, it, this was one of the first few bullet points that I had on the website. And I received a lot of criticism from a number of women who uh, basically told me, why are you even bringing this up? Because just by talking about this, you're actually playing into the hands of people who are looking for a reason to uh, hire fewer women or pay them less or just let them go. So there is that fear, you know, and I'm, uh, in a way, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, through your survey, you've been able to get people to talk about it because I think a lot of people, it's like it's become a quiet suffering and that's not good. You know, like people are quietly suffering just like a lot of people who are dealing with PMS, women who are pregnant are having other problems that they're not talking about. So it just feels like women feel like, I mean, maybe, the, maybe some of the people that have contacted me, maybe they don't have any problems. Maybe they've never felt any symptoms. 
but I've certainly felt the symptoms with PMS and I'm definitely not looking forward to the uh, symptoms when I get to the menopause age. The point is, you see, the statistics show that 20% of women who go through menopause don't have any symptoms, but the rest 20, do to so varying not degrees. Eight. So it may be that the people that are contacting you are in that 20%, for example, um, or maybe not. The, the point is they're lacking education because if they look at this rationally, what I want to do is take the stigma out of menopause by calling it a midlife refuel. And winding back on that, why I'm calling it a midlife refuel is that we did five separate studies on women of childbearing age, and we found that between 50 to 80% of them had low levels of important nutrients. And since then, billions of women, according to more recent research, have got nutritional deficiencies, things like magnesium, iron, zinc, essential fatty acids, calcium, vitamin D, and so on. And that affects your brain chemistry and your hormone function. And it leaves you firing on two cylinders instead of four and, and in what I call economy mode. And then you've got the added whammy when you get to perimenopause of the fact that your ovaries are winding down. And so instead of having millions of eggs, eventually you have none and you've got empty estrogen receptor sites. And we need to fill those naturally, ideally, so that we can fool the brain into thinking you've got normal circulating estrogen. Because all that's happening when you've got, because we weren't living much past 50, 100 years ago, it didn't really matter. But now when 40 something represents halfway for so many of us, it's so important that we learn how to meet our needs and have this midlife refuel. And I think if you go forward into the future, maybe in five or 10 years time, all workplaces, hopefully, will have this facility where women can self-select in their 40s to have their midlife refuel, to learn how to have it. And at that point, they won't actually have symptoms. They can deal with any symptoms they've got. If they've got PMS, they can deal with that too. And they just come out the end of it feeling symptom-free, better than they can remember. And the research shows it also helps to future-proof your health. So it prevents, helps to prevent things like the bone thinning disease, osteoporosis, heart disease, dementia, and even things like diabetes and obesity. So it makes great sense on so many levels. We just need to take the M word away because people don't seem to like that and replace it with the midlife refuel. And there's nothing to stop men having a refuel either. It's just that I've got my attention very much on women at the moment, but eventually there's a possibility that it could be for everybody because we're all living so much longer. Women are expected to stay in the workplace now until they're almost 70 and, and maybe women would choose to stay for even longer if they felt well and that would be good on so many levels because they've got so much wisdom and also because they are wanting to be productive and feel fulfilled and full of purpose and that's so important I don't I think retirement isn't all it's cracked up to be necessarily unless you've got exactly. massive hobbies or voluntary work that you've been dying to do all your life to just sit there and wonder what happens next is probably really bad for your health yeah i mean i'm definitely i'm not gonna retire uh, just there's no point it's not necessarily just about money it's about having that sense of being productive there's a lot of research done nothing to do with women per se just people after the many people after retirement uh, get ill you know they get terminal diseases and you know they just lose their, that their sense of purpose and sense of you know productiveness you know we all as humans, we like to be needed, you know, to be wanted in the society, to be needed. If you have the energy, you know, like one of my clients who is a managing director of Steinway Pianos, he's 70. And, you know, he's like, he's got the brain of a, you know, 30 year old because he's so clued on, clued on and really knows, understands. He's like, of all the people around him, he is younger in terms of his mind and the way that he thinks about digital technologies, but also when you look at his lifestyle, you know, he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he exercises. So it makes no difference, you know, like it could be the same if you're a woman, makes no difference whether you're a man or a woman, you know, you, as long as you keep going and you put your body, your mind to work, it's, you're going to feel that sense of vitality. And making a difference to the world, you know, having something to get out of bed for. Exactly. But, ha exactly. but you've got to feel well enough to do that. And that's the whole point, that people don't. They're just not educated about the fact that they need to have this refuel so that they can get turbocharged and carry on. And then the possibilities are infinite and they can 
play outside the workplace as well as be really productive in the workplace and carry on competing with men as they have been doing very successfully all through their working life. And so it is a challenge because we're starting from, we're starting on the back foot, as it were, because no one really understands, or very few people really understand that there are these amazing possibilities and that it's not rocket science. You know, it is simple. Yeah. It's just making some changes to your diet and lifestyle and knowing what to do and according to your own particular situation and your symptom set, what you should be doing to make yourself feel well and to have somebody to work with you to help you get motivated and get on the right track. It is hopeful, as you say, because we see, for example, we made a film and I got 10 women to come along who'd been through my program. So my program originally was a five month program, but when one million women watched my four Facebook films in 12 weeks, I had to get organized and, and I created a six week course, which was a virtual course and six bite sized modules. And we thought we'd just be teaching women, but actually we were turning their lives around very positively. So we got 10 of them to come along for this filming session. And I'd honestly forgotten how they felt when they were, when I met them. And when they were telling their stories, it just made me cry because I realized that they'd gone from being suicidal, leaving the workplace, thinking they had dementia and being so scared and isolated, feeling life was over to back to feeling better than they can remember. And as one of them said, practically a new woman. And that particular woman was a woman called Professor Jo Brewis. She was one of the authors of the Government in the Workplace report on menopause in the workplace. Uh, in 2017, the one I mentioned before. And she confided in me at the conference I met her at that she thought she had early onset dementia. And she also had acne on her face for the first time in her life. And she was feeling tired and depressed and constipated. And I said to her, come on our programme, you know, let's just see if we can help you. And within the space of, I can't remember if it was exactly six weeks or eight weeks or whatever it was, but she got to be completely symptom free. She got her brain back. She was thinking of leaving the workplace because she couldn't remember anyone's name and she couldn't remember what she was saying mid-sentence. Well, within the space of a few months, she was back to having perfect clarity, feeling well, she had energy, her gut was working normally, her skin was clear, her mood was buoyant. And eventually she went on and became head of department at her university instead of leaving the workplace. So other women in that group, there was a midwife who'd been signed off and couldn't work. She's back to delivering multiple babies and having a great time with her wisdom and teaching other midwives. And, do you know, it's just it's such a great feeling to be able to turn these women's lives around. And it's such a terrible feeling to think about them being left in this awful state and not helped to get themselves back into good shape, not even know that they can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, when sometimes uh, people say, why do you work so hard? They ask, like, what is the meaning of life for you? You know, when you're dying, are you going to say, oh, I wish I had worked more? The way I look at this is that the meaning of life for me is the experiences that we create, you know, the experiences the, the happiness, you know, so, whether sometimes it's sadness, but the more we can create happiness for ourselves and other people, that makes my life worth living. You know, and, and I think that sometimes following accepted route that society tells you, this is the way that things should be. You need to get to this age, get married, then have children. Then, you know, like, uh, I don't necessarily think that that will make everybody happy. That, you know, a lot of us fall into that hamster wheel and you would say like, and many people do feel happy, right? And so, so it's just about understanding to me that what gives meaning to my life is how can I make other people happier? How can I alleviate their suffering? And what, that's what you're describing. And I think so much of the happiness of our lives, um, I mean, I don't have children, I chose not to have children. For a lot of people, you know, it's like, it, okay, if it's through their children, their, uh, what they do for their family, but eventually we all get to an age that the children do leave home and, you know, like things change, maybe your spouse dies, right? But if you are able to m maintain your mental and physical faculties, you know, all the way through your life, you know, and, and live every year, whether you're 70, 80, 90, 100, you know, if, if you can live in a way that you're, you feel like you're engaged 
with the world. You're mindful, you're, you're present. You know, because when you lose your health, you're not present. And, and to me, meaning of life for me is to help other people and myself have the maximum amount of presence in, in their lives, in their lifetime, and to be able to choose to create experiences. When we are unwell, we are not in a position to be able to create beautiful experiences, not for ourselves, not for other people, right? So I'm able to work 15 hours a day, you know, 14, 15 hours a day, because I have a very good doctor. She you know, makes, helps me with my nutrition. I remember when I went to Celia, who was one of the panelists, when I went to see her two years ago, I was an absolute mess. You know, I was like, I was in it, I was still working very, very long hours and I was over medicated, not sleeping, you know, not eating properly. And she just shaped, you know, my life back to, <laughs> to some kind of, and now I feel I still work as many hours, but I was going through all these experiences of anxiety and depression and you know from just from not looking after myself right? there's a massive overlap between mental health and menopause because a lot of these symptoms are not just the hot flashes and the night sweats they're panic attacks and palpitations and anxiety to the point where some of the people i've met have been taken to hospital by ambulance multiple times thinking they're having a heart attack and it's really very scary, but actually it's to do with their menopause. And within a few weeks, all those things, once they make a change to their diet and lifestyle and they're on track, all of those symptoms completely disappear. And I think that we, we know we did a survey on 1,100 women um, not so long ago and asked them what happened when they went to their doctor. 37% of them were prescribed antidepressants for menopause. And 84% of those didn't feel it was appropriate because they didn't feel that they had clinical depression. 41% were given hormone replacement therapy. 14% didn't take it because they were too scared of the side effects. And of the ones who did take it, 61% came off it because of adverse side effects. And they were just left to fend for themselves. So I think that you, you're right. You've got to be in, to be in the game, you've got to be healthy. And to be healthy, you've got to be educated and know how to meet your needs. And going on from what you're saying about fulfilling your purpose, I don't think there's anything, anything in the world as wonderful as being able to help someone else. And obviously, if you're in good shape, you're in, in a position to do that. And I think that people who are 40 plus have got so much wisdom. And this planet really needs all the wisdom it can get. And we need to make sure that those people know how to nurture themselves so that they can help to make this world a better place for all of us. And I think it's a win-win situation on so many levels for the women themselves, for their families. We know we did a, another survey on relationships where we found that 70% of women lost their libido and over half of them had vaginal dryness. They couldn't have a physical relationship with their partner. So many relationships completely fall apart. And our men's survey showed that men are scared, they feel rejected and they don't know how to communicate and they lose sight of the person that they fell in love with because she's not recognizable anymore and so it's so important to spend just a few months and especially going through the pandemic now when so many people are locked up to just spend the next few months nurturing yourself and learning how to have this midlife refuel will make the world of difference when the world opens up again and it just gives so many possibilities to women on so many levels in and out of the workplace and that's why we're developing tech so that we can reach millions of women with this information and personalize their programs so that everyone has the program they need with tech instantly and then to be able to have the tech help to motivate them the way we do at the moment so that they stick to it because human nature shows that very often once we feel a bit better we think oh I'm okay now I don't really need to do this anymore so you know there are kind of signposts along the way and more information to keep them on the straight and narrow and then looking at the longer term once you come out the end of menopause well menopause is only one day it's the anniversary of your last period and then you're postmenopausal for the rest of your life and, and you're not going to feel miraculously better then unless you learn how to meet your needs. And so it's never too early to make this start because your eggs, probably everything reaches its peak by about 35. And it's never too late to learn to meet your needs to make your life, make longevity a better experience.
Exactly. So um, I want to talk to you about the technology, but before we get to the technology, are you telling me that all of these symptoms can be dealt with with just nutrition, exercise, sleep? We don't use anything other than natural things and everything we do is based on published medical research. So no matter what the symptoms, whether it's aches and pains, brain fog, hot flushes, cravings, depression, whatever it is, that we can address it. My program is, it's a kind of five-pronged attack, really. It's for, the first thing we're doing is teaching women how to get themselves back into good nutritional shape, because we know that they've probably got deficiencies, and there are physical signs of vitamin and, and mineral deficiencies. So we help them detect and correct those deficiencies, and we take out of their diet in the short term anything that's likely to impede the absorption of those nutrients so that they get the best possible chance to get the refuel. Then we know that they've got empty estrogen receptor sites because the ovaries aren't working anymore. So we teach them how to consume naturally occurring estrogen in the form of food and supplements that have been through clinical trials. And then we teach them about the supplements for their symptom set that again have been through published medical research. So we know that they're safe, they're standardized, and that they're not going, they're going to be effective because they are standardized and so many supplements aren't. So it's important to choose the ones that are. And we've brought together research from all over the world and put it in one place so that women can access it and sort out, obviously, if they come on our program, we work it out for them. If they read, for example, my new book, which just got published in the UK last week, uh, Manage Your Menopause Naturally, which is uh, here, I've put all, this is like the course manual. So I've put everything in there. People can actually, in chapter four, for example, they can go in and um, check out the supplements and work out which ones to take. And then after that, we get them doing some relaxation. So formal relaxation shows if you do 20 or 30 minutes a day of proper formal relaxation, like meditation or guided meditation, you can actually reduce hot flushes by 50 to 60 percent. And then we get them doing some exercise as well, depending on their fitness level. So it's not a marathon for those who aren't used to exercising, maybe just dancing to your favorite music or doing something on YouTube, whatever it is you like doing, but to actually build up your stamina and your fitness, which helps to oxygenate your brain, helps you to trim down the weight, the excess weight that people seem to gain at this time when their metabolism is slowing down. And it also helps to and release those wonderful endorphins that make us feel good, so it helps our mood as well. So they're, they're the main things, but there are lots of other research to show that things like cognitive behavior therapy, acupuncture, cranial osteopathy, you know, there's, there are so many things, mindfulness, and so I've put those in the book as well, and we incorporate those into the program where they're indicated, because obviously everyone's different. Some people, know how to meditate, for example. Some people, they have busy minds and they can't switch off and relax. So maybe they need a, an app or they need something different. And it's just it is different for everybody. Everyone has a different medical history, a different life experience, and so and different tastes and maybe a different budget. So we're just looking at tailoring the whole thing. And we're in the process of creating the tech to do that. So technically, this program is something that you should be doing all your life anyway, right? So like the, really just like a healthy lifestyle. But I guess if you haven't had that for a lot of your life, then when it comes to a stage at your life where also your body is not playing along anymore, like I think because when we are younger, we can get away with abusing our body sometimes to, to some degree. But when you get older, the body just doesn't want to play along. It's like, you know, just leave me alone. You're right. I mean, my before we started helping women with menopause, I was helping women with PMS for many years at the advisory service I ran. And 94% of the women were completely symptom free within the space of four months. And that was because we taught them how to put back into their body what time and nature had taken out in terms of nutrients and got them exercising and taking some supplements and they were feeling they had the refuel after they maybe had their babies or they'd been living life in the fast lane and not eating very well being too stressed or whatever it was and they got back to feeling really well again and so you're right the earlier you start because when my pms patients have come back 
years later for help with menopause, they haven't really been suffering in a major way. They just need to have their program tweaked because their needs have changed and they can then just carry on because once, once you're armed with the knowledge, you're armed with it for life. And so eventually, hopefully, it'll be something we learn about in school and certainly as teenagers, uh, because I did a book years ago called Healthy Parents, Healthy Baby, which was all about preconception and pregnancy. And I wrote that because I was so inspired by a professor from Southampton University that I met at a conference who explained that the health of a baby, not just in babyhood, but in adulthood, and even what it dies from, is predetermined by the health of the egg and the sperm 100 days prior to conception. And I was blown away by that. And I'm sure most people don't even really realize that. So the earlier you get educated, the better it is going to be for everybody in terms of the health of yourself and the health of your family. And obviously your ability to stay in the workplace and be productive and do all these random acts of kindness or whatever it is you choose to do you'll be in a place where you can do them. Rather than, as some of the women say to me when I meet them, they've been curled up in a ball in their bedroom, unable to even get out of bed, and they are just so scared because they don't recognise themselves. And that's what drives me, because I feel a deep sense of injustice that women are left like this. And so whilst I hear your women who say, don't mention the M word, we don't have any choice. And I think when women really understand why we need to talk about it and why we need to get this solution widely available, then it just means it's creating a level playing field. Everybody has the opportunity to stay healthy. And then if you choose not to do it, then it's entirely up to you. But not knowing that you can do it is atrocious. Yeah, and you know what? It's not just about the workplace. It's also like that sense of being desirable. When you were talking about the injustice, I feel one of the most unjust things that I can think of when it comes to women that approach about 50 is that there are many, many men out there that, let's say, you know, you, you've been in a happy marriage all your life. You know, maybe you're in your 50s and you're husband passes away or, or you, you know you break up or whatever but does it mean that you're going to have to be alone for the rest of your life the problem is that the society has created this image of women over 50 that it just feels like they are less in the market or in the in the in the mating pool in a way you know and that's a shame because what like you're going to be alone for the rest of your your life because you've reached 50 and it, and I can see that behavior in the dating apps and actually I'm thinking about creating my own dating app because um, I saw when I after my breakup I saw things about how these apps or haven't really changed and you know they can be changed they can be they can be improved so much but but part of that is also about women presenting themselves not just presenting themselves actually feeling so much more that sense of vitality because i'm noticing that like men who are in their 50s and 60s they're going for much much younger female potential mates and then uh, many of them are not even looking at women over 50 and uh, 60 and it's like it's, it's like I see a man who is like in their 70s or 60s not checking out women uh, near their own age because the society has sort of you know it, it has become accepted in our minds that you know like that women after that age they are just not interested yeah go back to my survey or our relationship survey where we found that 70 percent of them lost their libido and over half of them have vaginal dryness. Well, if they're not feeling sexy and they've lost their mojo and they can't think straight and they're not sleeping and their thermometer's all over the place, you know, having hot flushes, then they're not going to be desirable. And also, they won't have their, what I call their lamp on. Do you know when you're feeling sexy and you're strutting your stuff and you know that you walk down the street and people are kind of looking at you and you know you feel good? But when your lamp goes off because you're not feeling good anymore, then you're out the game. And that's why I think that if you start your dating app, I'd love to incorporate some nutrition so that, you know, some education about how do you stay well? How do you effectively? I wrote an article last week, actually, for the Daily Mail. And in there, it was about the physical signs of vitamin and mineral deficiency. It was called menopause phase. And in there, I said that you can effectively turn back your biological clock. 
And I got criticized for that by some women who said, I don't want to turn back my biological clock. But I didn't mean that I was, I didn't mean I was going to turn them into young bimbos. I, I just mean that, do you know, if you, the women in the film will tell you they look and feel at least 10 years younger. They feel better than they can remember. Their skin looks amazing. Their hair's growing. Their nails are not splitting. They've got energy. They're not aching anymore. Do you know? And they get their mojo back. So they're in the game again. And that makes the world a difference. And I think that when people realize, you know, for a man in his 50s or 60s, if he has a relationship with a woman in her 20s or 30s, they probably don't like the same music. They probably got completely different life experiences. They'll come to realize that eventually, if they could have find a sexy, wise woman of a similar age who is intellectually challenging and stimulating on all levels, then they'd probably be very happy with that. But that's not what's happening at the moment. I completely agree. I mean, I, I, I went out with somebody who was um, about 17 years older than me for five years, and I did love him very much, but it eventually didn't work out because, you know, I remember like him talking about certain things like pop punk music from his era that I had no, like I couldn't relate to, you know, like I, I, I was from a different generation and yes. it, it just, it just didn't make sense. Um, and fortunately, he just chose somebody who was closer to his age, and it was better for both of us. At the time, it was difficult because, you know, I still loved him. But, it, but it, you're right. It just this thing that the society has created where, you know, like older men are going for people like about 20 years younger than them, you know, while they could have a lot more in common with somebody closer to their age, as long as those women had the mojo, right? So that's why the mojo is important. <laughs> exactly. So that's why this is important on so many levels. I think that if we don't, which is why I feel in the next five years, this is my big mission to change the whole face of this so that we've got tech in place, not just for menopause, but also for PMS as well. And so that um, people can learn how to get themselves into really good shape and it can all be done it won't replace people, but technology will be a very big part of it. And I think that that will be a big legacy for, and it will change things, as you say, both in and out of the workplace. And it will give people the confidence that they need to enter new relationships. And just, if you, I, I think you've got to love yourself, haven't you, first of all. If you love yourself and you feel good in your own skin, then you're going to be much more attractive to other people. Yeah, I know. I know. And like... I think this whole thing about loving yourself, I, I'm going to say something that I hope it doesn't come across as narcissistic because that's not what I mean. But it's like there are days when I wake up in the morning and I'm like, okay, I'm 38, right? And and I'm, I wake up in the morning. Oh God, I actually just turned 39. Don't tell anybody. I forgot. <laughs> it was my birthday a few days ago. <laughs> yeah. And I, I wake up in the morning sometimes and I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, dude, I do not look 38, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm like, like, I feel so full of energy, you know, I feel like in my mid 20s, that's how I feel, you know, if people didn't see my CV, they would never tell that I am the age, it's only when they see my CV that they're like, oh, so she must be, she must have been around for a while, you know, but it just feels like, having that sense of that you don't feel it you know like my brain is sharper than ever my you know energy is higher than ever and I can keep going um so to be able to have that sense of vitality you then give that to other people you know you you exude that you actually attract people whether it's in a work environment whether it's in a you know, in a relationship environment, you actually, people want to be around somebody who exudes energy, who is like happy and has a lot of, a lot to give. And a positive mindset as well. I think that's the other thing. It's really important to when, and you can't really have a positive mindset very well if you're feeling bad. Do you know, if you're not sleeping well and you're anxious or your mood is down, you're aching and you're in pain. How on earth can you have a positive mindset? And so that's another reason for getting yourself into really good shape. And also in the long term, if you think about how much it costs for even things like type two diabetes and obesity, if we could help with tech for those kind of things as well, so we could prevent those, we would help to save in the UK 
the National Health Service from massive bills. And in other countries around the world as well, there'll be huge savings. And so I think that it's, this is, we start, the starting point for us at the moment is menopause, but there is huge potential to use the neural network and the AI framework that we're building for so many other conditions and situations so that we can... Tell me about that. Tell me about the, uh, the technology part. Do you have a technology background or how did you come no. up with that? Or you just <laughs> educated yourself? <laughs> I don't have a technology background at all, actually. I'm probably the least tech person, but for, we have a wonderful woman in our team who um, comes from Texas and she has got a tech background. Uh, she's also been an award-winning filmmaker and she does our website and all sorts of other things. So she's been an absolute gem uh, for us. And then we are working at the moment with the Female Ventures Fund in London. And they're helping us to raise money to fund this tech initiative. And they've very kindly given us the uh, CTO who was the CTO for the founder of Invotech, who run the Female Ventures Fund. And they've worked together for about 20 years and they've done many fint very successful fintech projects. And so they're now very excited about helping us with this. And there's a whole team of people who know exactly what they're doing and getting on to help us create in the next nine months all that we need to create. And so I'm very lucky that because I was worried about how do you identify the right team. And I, I'm one of these people that really believe that if something's meant to happen, the universe will deliver. You know, and you'll just meet the right people and they will just come because they're meant to. They'll show up. And that's what's been happening, really. So I'm... I would say yeah, we, that we co-create our reality with the universe. You put yourself in the right place at the right time and, and the right things come together. Um, yeah. So the takeaway lesson for me from what you're saying from a technology perspective is that you don't necessarily need to have a technology background, but you need to have educated yourself about understanding what are some of the possibilities out there. You know, so for other entrepreneurs, maybe looking at what you're doing with the program, uh, who may feel like, you know what, I've got an idea and I'm gonna go out there and create a business around, you know, something to do with helping women or anything else, but especially for our audience, you don't necessarily need to be like a, a programmer. You just need to know yeah. on a conceptual level, you know, what is and uh, you know what is the possibilities within AI and what kind of algorithms you can use. And yeah, I think you've got to be educated. I've met quite a few uh, female founders who've partnered with a tech person, so that they've been co-founders, and I think that probably would work very well. In my case, that isn't what happened, but I did manage to find a really good tech team. And obviously over the year, because I met these million women when I made these four Facebook films, I had to get organized and create this six-week course. And that six-week course eventually became our MVP. We actually created the tech around that so it runs from your phone and, or any device and all the course materials in there and it tracks your symptoms and so on. Um, and you can access all the live course material and the sessions through that. So we've been on a tech journey anyway for the last couple of years. And then it, we've got to the point now where we need to take the leap to actually, at the moment, we can help probably hundreds and thousands of women, but we can't reach tens of thousands and millions of women without having the tech. So where... it's about scaling it right now, oh, right? Very much so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's been great talking to you, Marianne, and I'm sure we will be talking to you again over the course of the coming month to see where you are with the journey and like uh, how, and, and I know that we've been talking about, hopefully I will get involved uh, and, and help you as well. Maybe as a closing remark for this particular podcast today, I wanted to see if you have something to say to other women who are maybe now reaching the third quarter of their lives is that the third quarter? Maybe the third quarter of the life is not the right way. Like because within a century, we, we have the third, 25th, the five year of their life. Or even in, I think, women in their 40s. I think that I'd like to speak to women in their 40s. I mean, obviously, in their 50s, they need to deal with the fact that they are going through the menopause. But in their 40s, you've got this eight years leading up to menopause called perimenopause. And that's when things start going sideways. And if you learn how to meet your needs early on, then you're just not going to fall down that dark hole. Really? Um, it starts that early? Yes. So it's, um, and I, I think the main thing is to give women hope 
and to just think about this as something that is completely within their reach. It's just finding sound science-based information, getting some help. People that suffer mildly to moderately or just want to prevent things, they could get my book, for example, go through it and work it out for themselves. People that are suffering moderately to severely are going to probably need some help. And if they're working with a workplace who are enlightened, then hopefully they'll get it through the workplace. But if not, they can get help as individuals outside the workplace. But whatever they choose to do, I just want people to know that it is possible to, if you learn to meet your needs, to get back into a position where you feel better than you can remember. And as you described, feel ageless. I mean, I get up every morning and I'm grateful for the day beyond grateful for the day. I do my exercise to blaring music and it makes me feel as high as a kite and helps me keep my weight down and, you know, feel I have my best ideas when I'm exercising. So that's, it works from a work perspective as well. And then I embrace the day and get on with the day and do all the good things. I practice what I preach in terms of eating wholesome food and, and a good lifestyle. But I happen to like chocolate after my dinner and I have a glass of wine occasionally. You know, that, it's not a life sentence. The program can be enjoyable once you've got yourself back into a really good shape. And life is fun and, and full of adventure. And I think that everyone can hope for that. And that's probably what I, my parting message, that you don't have to feel 90 before your time. You can actually get back to feeling better than you can remember. Yeah, exactly. I recently um, read, read like you just last last words before you go. I recently read a book called Lifespan. You may have known. Uh, I don't know if you know about it. Or it's written by an uh, a Harvard University professor, and it, he talks about the fact that he says like aging in the sense that we think about is is actually a disease, and you know like any other disease, you can prevent it by. Uh, the right kind of nutrition and lifestyle. There's so much that we still don't know about our bodies, especially about fe female um, biology, but there are things that we do know. And if we make sure that we tick all those boxes and look after ourselves, that is going to buy us many more productive years there, because we are all going to live longer because of technology, but we want to live longer with a higher quality of life. There's no point living forever if you're, you know, you've got dementia or osteoporosis and you can't function. You want to be in good shape so that you can actually really enjoy life and contribute because that's where a lot of self joy comes from, doesn't it? Personal joy, as we said, from helping other people. Yeah, thank you so much. And it's been very inspiring talking to you. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Marianne Stewart. Be sure to check out her work and order her amazing books and get in touch with her if you would like to find out more about how she can help you, be it as an individual or as an organization. Also be sure to subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify or any other one of your favorite podcast channels and don't forget to give it a five-star review. You can also find the full video of these conversations on my YouTube channel. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, or Clubhouse at Somi Ariel. Finally, if you aren't a member of Fempeak yet, head over to fempeak.ai, register, and join a community that actively supports women.